president delivered his first State of the Union address this week, and controversy is brewing over the release of a memo alleging FBI corruption in the lead-up to last year's election. Here with insider analysis is White House Director of Strategic Communications, Mercedes Schlapp. And later, the Vatican is moving toward a deal with China over the appointment of bishops. Is such an agreement advisable, given the communist nation's dismal record on human and religious rights? China watchers Stephen Mosier and Reggie Littlejohn will tell us. Finally, we'll talk to the stars and real-life heroes of the new Clint Eastwood film, The 1517 to Paris, the world over. Begins right now. Now, from Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. A very important show for you tonight. Mercedes Schlapp, Stephen Mosher, Reggie Littlejohn, and the heroes of Clint Eastwood's 1517 to Paris are all straight ahead. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet at Raymond Arroyo. I'll be live tweeting throughout the show, or you can email us at worldover at EWTN.com. Let's get right to it. The president offered his first State of the Union address on Tuesday. In it, the president called on Congress to set aside politics and overhaul the nation's immigration system. Trump outlined what he called an American first immigration plan. The four pillars include a path to citizenship for nearly two million young immigrants who came to the U.S. illegally, $25 billion for border security and his promised southern border wall, the end of the visa lottery program, moving to merit-based immigration, and an end to the so-called chain migration of extended family of immigrants. President Trump said it was time to replace outdated rules and bring America's immigration system into the 21st century. These four pillars represent a down-the-middle compromise and one that will create a safe, modern, and lawful immigration system. For over 30 years, Washington has tried and failed to solve this problem. This Congress can be the one that finally makes it happen. Most importantly, these four pillars will produce legislation that fulfills my ironclad pledge to sign a bill that puts America first. Democrats were none too receptive to his bipartisan overtures. House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi said Trump is holding DACA-protected immigrants hostage. She called the president's plan the most extreme anti-immigrant agenda in generations. Here to analyze all of this, I'm joined by White House Director of Strategic Communications, Mercedes Schlapp, and she joins us from the White House. Mercedes, thanks for being here. Uh, Thank the, you the president delivered a full-throated endorsement of his administration's first year in his State of the Union address the other night, even calling for common ground with Democrats. Listen. Tonight, I call upon all of us to set aside our differences, to seek out common ground, and to summon the unity we need to deliver for the people. This is really the key. These are the people we were elected to serve. So let's begin tonight by recognizing that the state of our union is strong because our people are strong. It was a very different tone from the president, Mercedes. What did the White House hope to achieve with this speech, and did the president accomplish it? Well, the, the speech, it was an incredibly powerful message from President Trump. And he was uh, speaking directly to the American people, uh, talking about the need to unify our country, uh, talking about the need of, of, of what we need to build, which is that of a, a, a strong nation, a safe nation, as well as talking about the American family, that we're all in this together. He also wanted to remind Americans that 
it's their turn. It's There's their turn to live the American dream and that the president is working day in and day out to build a strong economic foundation, a strong cultural foundation for our families so that they're able to be lifted up and have expanded economic opportunities uh, to be able to succeed and even have extra money in their pocket uh, to be able to, uh, to help their own families. Well, Mercedes, not everyone was persuaded by the president's attempt at outreach. Uh, indeed, uh, Nancy Pelosi derided that money people are getting in their pockets as crumbs. And then she went on to say this. It was a very uh, transformative speech for some of us last night, because while we, our expectations for greatness and vision with the president are not high, uh, he stooped to a new low in terms of how he dealt with issues, for example, the immigration issue and what it has meant to our country and how he characterized your reaction to that uh, she was not happy and it doesn't seem as if she's moved to partisanship well i think it just sounds like the, that it just sounds as if the democrats are turning their backs on the american people i mean clearly uh, the president's speech was was filled with uh, issue-based uh, topics that were bipartisan. I mean, you talk about infrastructure, you talk about immigration reform, uh, you talk about a booming economy. That is something that all Americans partake in. And the fact is, is that the Democrats still are holding a grudge against this president because he won the election and because he's being successful at his job. And so it's, it's very unfortunate that the Democrats are thinking along the lines of, well, let's take away the American uh, family's tax cut, which, as we know, uh, what the president ha is providing is that of paycheck increases. You've had over 3 million workers who have received uh, bonuses or raises. You've had over 250 companies uh, basically, again, providing bonuses or raises uh, to their employees. I mean, it is a powerful time in our economy where there is hope job creation, wage increase, which is that of benefiting uh, the growth of America. And as we know, mm -hmm. economic security in America means national security. So uh, it, is, it's, it is a fact of the, where America is today is that we're in a much stronger position today than we were uh, before President uh, Trump took office. Mercedes, the president touted that economic explosion, uh, particularly the low unemployment numbers, especially among African Americans and Hispanic Americans. These are the lowest really that they've they've seen since they've begun tracking them still congresswoman maxine waters offered her rebuttal of the state of the union on bet the other night and she had this to say he attempts to take credit for economic growth but refuses to acknowledge that he inherited our nation's thriving economy from our nation's first black president under President Obama, the unemployment rate fell from 10 percent to 4.8 percent, and the African-American unemployment rate fell nine percentage points. Trump often works to convince dissatisfied elements in our society that all of their problems are caused by people of color. Mercedes, your reaction? Well, I mean, clearly what we have seen of this benefit of our economy and the fact that it was President Trump who created the two million jobs that we have seen. It's President Trump that we know has created this eight trillion dollars of wealth um, that, that has benefited in the stock market. I mean, these are numbers that are clearly linked to President Trump. The other thing is with President Trump is that in his tax cut law, um, there's these opportunity zones uh, which get, provide investments for distressed communities, which means it goes straight into uh, the communities where there's uh, African Americans and Hispanics. Mm -hmm. uh, the president's also working, especially this year, to invest in workforce development, in vocational training, in helping to lift Americans, all Americans, out of poverty. What we saw under President Obama was a cycle of poverty, where there was increased poverty, there was uh, individuals, a, a record number of individuals on food stamps. And, and the reality was is that it's truly under President Trump that we have seen the enormous economic uh, growth under his time and not under President Obama's time. Mercedes, one of the centerpieces of the president's speech was his reference to illegal immigration and the so-called dreamers. He also laid out his immigration plan, as we talked about earlier. Watch this. I am extending an open hand to work with members of both parties. Democrats and Republicans, 
to protect our citizens of every background, color, religion, and creed. My duty and the sacred duty of every elected official in this chamber is to defend Americans, to protect their safety, their families, their communities, and their right to the American dream. Because Americans are dreamers, too. Americans are dreamers, too. He also highlighted parents of children slain by that MS-13 gang. Democrats say the president is demonizing immigrants. Is he? Oh, absolutely not. I mean, this president knows that this is a nation of immigrants. Obviously, we want legal immigration, but the, the legal immigration that we want, that is being proposed is that of a merit-based system. Those would be legal immigrants coming in based on skills and the fact of being able to contribute to our economy. This is how many countries do this in Australia, Canada, New Zealand. It is the, the right approach in dealing with legal immigration. The problem has become is that for decades we have ignored uh, the crisis on the border, mm -hmm. the fact that you've had border crossing apprehensions increase, the fact that you have um, illegal immigrants who have come through the border, many of them MS-13 gang members who are now infiltrating communities. Mm -hmm. And guess the communities that are impacted are actually many Latino communities, many African American communities. And we saw this obviously with one of the guests, uh, the families that were there of yeah. the the, the victims of MS-13 gang violence. And the, the reality is, is that we need to be able to close the loopholes in order to protect our homeland, in order to modernize and provide a safe uh, immigration system. Mm -hmm. Mercedes, before the speech was even delivered, the U.S. Catholic bishops issued a statement in response to the president's immigration reform plan. They said, and I'll put it on the screen, we welcome the administration's proposal to include a path to citizenship for dreamers. However, the proposed cuts to family immigration and elimination of protections to unaccompanied children are deeply troubling. Family immigration is part of the bedrock of our country and our church. And then they went on to quote Pope Francis. Uh, why is chain migration such a centerpiece of the, the president's plan? And uh, w what's the danger here? They say this is family immigration. Right. And, and when we're talking about ending chain migration, we are protecting the nuclear family. And that is spouses and minor children who will be able to come through a legal process. The problem becomes is when you're it's all the extended um, individuals, mm. because what happens is, is that it's no longer based on a, on skills uh, that we need to match up our economic needs. It, it's simply that of just family family relationships. And so what happens is, is you end up creating a, a, a cycle of where you have just one 15 of these immigrants coming into our country with the right skill base. Uh, and so we have to remember that part of this is ensuring uh, that we do protect the nuclear family, that we do find a permanent solution to DACA, mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time that we have the merit-based system, which we know is applied in many countries and could really help and boost our economy while at the same time protecting the American worker. Uh, with that being said, this uh, president's immigration framework is nearly seven in 10 Americans agree with how the president has laid out this framework. It's very mainstream. It's a generous compromise. We believe we can get bipartisan support on this framework. And I have to say, I have been in through this before where it's been decades where this issue has not been solved. Mm -hmm. We need to find a way where we secure our border, where we have our ICE agents and our Border Patrol agents empowered and have the resources they need to deal with the crisis on the border. And at the same time, a compassionate solution given to DACA recipients out of 1.8 million DACA recipients who would uh, receive legal status and a pathway to citizenship. Mercedes, tell me about this FISA memo. I want to shift gears for a moment here. Uh, there's a lot of talk about whether the president will release this. Now, this is a memo that was drawn up by the House Intelligence Committee, the Republicans who are in the majority on that committee. Uh, it's kind of their version of events of, of what led to the surveillance of the Trump campaign, the FISA request to put in to secure that surveillance. 
Why is this such a big deal and why is it taking so long to release it? Well, there's a review process in place. Obviously, the president uh, is receiving input from a wide range of stakeholders, including intelligence officials, the legal team. And so uh, at this point, we're still in the review process. Uh, no decision has been made. But as the president has stated before, this is a matter of full transparency. The president has been concerned of the abuses of FISA and the civil uh, rights infringement on, uh, on our law-abiding citizens. And at the same time, the president and expects full disclosure. So at this point, we're in the reviewing process. The president has read the memo. And uh, at, at this point, we have no announce, further announcement to make. Uh, Mercedes, uh, Christopher Ray, the FBI director, asked for some minor edits before that memo should be released to the public. Apparently, those edits were made. Now Christopher Ray is saying, well, they don't have enough information in the memo, so it shouldn't be released. Your thoughts? You you know, I haven't seen the memo. Again, I will, I'll say that it's going through its uh, review process. Uh, obviously, he's in uh, the president and his team is engaging the legal team and the intelligence officials. Uh, the, the, at this point, they're they're again looking through the process, and you know, the decision will be made when it will be made. It is a congressional document, mm -hmm. uh, so at the end of the day, it would be the House who would be releasing it. And at this point, uh, we're still in the review review okay. stages. Uh, final question, Congressman Trey Gowdy, uh, major figure in the GOP, also the, the chairman of the Appropriations Committee this week, both announcing they are stepping down, retiring, and will not seek re-election. 34 congressional Republicans have announced re retirement so far. Are you worried that the GOP could lose the majority in the midterms? Look, midterm elections, it's always a competitive time, uh, but I will tell you that based on the president's record, based on the work that the Republican Party is doing right now uh, in terms of the huge success they've had from an economic standpoint, from the, from, from the, from the energy that we're, we're feeling right now on the ground, mm -hmm. uh, I think the Republicans are going to be in, a, in strong shape. They ha we have a great economic story to tell to the American people. Uh, I can tell you the president and the GOP, they're fighting for the American people. They care. They want to make a difference. They want results. And the reality is, is that the only ones who have obstructed this process are the Democrats. I, we, I'm still in shock that the Democrats refuse to even stand up or applaud uh, so many of them uh, when the president spoke about unifying the country and just very simple uh, mm. kitchen table bipartisan issues. And yet uh, they, their only answer to this is not a solution, not an agenda, but simply to just obstruct and not move the ball forward for the American people. I think that is incredibly disappointing. And I think that at the end of the day, uh, the American people will realize that it's the Republican Party and the president who are committed to, to moving forward important agenda items like infrastructure, uh, like uh, workforce development, uh, as well as immigration reform. And, and they've just become more the party of the worker and the party of mainstream America. Very good, Mercedes Schlapp. Thank you for joining us and for the time, and we will check in again with you soon. Thank you. What is the thinking behind the Vatican's recent overtures to communist China regarding the appointment of bishops, and what's the state of religious and human rights there? President of the Population Research Institute, Stephen Mosier, and Reggie Littlejohn will join us here in studio with their insights when the world over returns. Don't miss this. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over. Here's the latest from the world, some international headlines. Ireland's government this week moved to lift the country's constitutional ban on abortions. In May, Ireland's voters will decide by referendum on whether to repeal the Eighth Amendment to Ireland's constitution. The 1983 amendment commits authorities to defend equally the right to life of a mother and an unborn child. As such, abortion is legal only in the rarest of cases when a mother's life is endangered. The predominantly Roman Catholic country has the strictest abortion laws in Europe. The Prime Minister of Ireland said he will campaign to remove the abortion ban, and the government would prepare draft legislation allowing an abortion on demand up to 12 weeks of pregnancy. We'll keep an eye on this story for you. And a change of course for Pope Francis in Chile. 
After months of controversy and a disastrous week of public criticism, Pope Francis is now dispatching to Chile the church's most high-profile and respected clerical abuse investigator. While in Chile last week, the pope on more than one occasion defended Bishop Juan Barros against an alleged clerical abuse cover-up. The pope had appointed Barros to lead the diocese of Osorno in 2015. In one instance, the pope said accusers should bring proof against Barros because he had not seen any. After a public rebuke from Boston Cardinal Sean O'Malley and others, the pope apologized for the comment but maintained his defense of the bishop. Now, the Pope has sent to Chile the top clerical abuse investigator, Archbishop Charles Schicciluna of Malta. The Vatican issued a statement that new information had been provided to Rome that warranted this investigation. And another cardinal is asking Pope Francis to clarify church teaching on marriage in light of the recent interpretations of his apostolic exhortation, Amoris Laetitia. Cardinal Wiem Eyck, leading prelate of the Netherlands, said this past week that the Holy Father needs to bring clarity to the doubts sown by Amoris Laetitia on the question of Holy Communion for those civilly divorced and remarried. Echoing sentiment of a growing number of bishops and cardinals, Eyck told a Dutch newspaper, people are confused and that is not good. He said of the uneven interpretations of the papal document around the world, quote, what is true in place A cannot suddenly be false in place B. Cardinal Ike suggested a new papal document is needed, one that contains the words of Christ himself, that marriage is open and unbreakable. Now some news from China. The Bishop Emeritus of Hong Kong, Cardinal Joseph Zen, a regular visitor to this show, says the Vatican is selling out the Catholic Church in China. In a January 29th letter addressed to the media, Cardinal Zen accused the Vatican of capitulating to the China regime and, in essence, giving its blessing on a new schismatic church created by communists. The Cardinal's letter comes days after news broke that the Vatican has reportedly asked legitimate underground bishops who are not recognized by the Chinese government to step down from their posts to make way for the installation of new illicitly ordained bishops hand-picked by the government. Cardinal Zen said that the Sino-Vatican deal will only enable the government to clamp down on faithful Catholics even harder. Cardinal Zen traveled to Rome to hand deliver a letter to Pope Francis expressing the concerns of the underground faithful in China. The Vatican is rejecting Zen's accusations. Joining us from Florida to discuss this is president of the Population Institute and author of the new book, Bully of Asia, Stephen Mosier. And here in studio with me, the president of Women's Rights Without Frontiers, Reggie Littlejohn. Thank you both for being here. You heard the story up top, uh, the Vatican trying to do a deal with China, and they're doing so by asking two Chinese bishops to step down for these illicitly ordained bishops. Stephen Mosier, given all that you've seen and heard and reported over the years, is this a prudent move on the part of the Vatican? No, absolutely not. The Chinese Communist Party has been hostile to religion from its very founding back in the 1920s. Chairman Mao in the 1950s tried to stamp out Catholicism altogether. When he failed in 1958, he set up a patriotic church. Uh, the underground church, of course, has been heroically sacrificing uh, for the last few decades. And now we have the new Red Emperor. We have Xi Jinping, who models himself on Chairman Mao. And since he took power in 2012, he's been gradually clamping down on all religious activity in China. Now he's insisting on the, the basically uh, the right to head the Catholic Church in China, because make no mistake about it, when the, the Patriotic Bishops' Conference reports to the Bureau of Religious Affairs, which reports to the Chinese Communist Party. The head of the party, the head of the state, is Xi Jinping himself. So he wants mm -hmm. to be appointed the head of the Catholic Church in China. He does not wish it well. He wants to gradually eliminate it over time by appointing what anyone would reasonably construe as, uh, I think Cardinal Zinn said, fake bishops. And, mm. and fake bishops they are. Reggie Littlejohn, I want to go to you. You've dealt with the human rights abuses in China, particularly the forced abortions. Uh, do you have any sense that the Chinese would make good on a deal with the Vatican, given that human rights records? We have seen bishops 
rounded up, churches destroyed, which we'll get into in a moment, and, and even believers killed. I do not think that the Chinese Communist Party is negotiating in good faith at all. I believe that what they care about is the consolidation of their power. And so they have demonstrated that over and over again with the forced abortions of hundreds of millions of women, uh, with the, the intense persecution of the underground church. And most recently, just one church this month and one church just before ch uh, Christmas were demolished. All right. All right. They have removed uh, thousands of crosses off of Christ Christian churches in China and jailed, tortured uh, priests and, and, and faithful lay people. In 1989, when communism fell in Europe, the Chinese studied this very carefully. And according to one report, there was an official who said, we've got to strangle that baby while it's still in the manger. That was their comment about Christianity in China. Mm -hmm. Why should we possibly trust them in the current negotiations? Yeah, well, I want to share something with both of you. In September, I interviewed Cardinal Joseph Zen, who's accused the Vatican now of selling out the underground church in an effort to do this deal with Beijing. I asked him then, Cardinal Zen, why the Vatican would enter into an agreement with the Chinese Communist regime at this time. Listen. I can understand that uh, uh, Pope Francis uh, is optimistic. Uh, he loves the whole world. Yeah. And uh, maybe uh, he, he trusts everybody. He believes that all are good people. Huh? Hmm. Uh, and he may not know really our communists. Hmm. He comes from South America. Yeah. And uh, there he knows the the persecuted communists, huh? mm. so they, he may have uh, uh, some uh, compassion uh, for the communists. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, the mystery for me is to see such optimism in in, in the people around him, the advisors around uh -huh. him, and especially the uh, the Secretary of State uh, Cardinal Parolin. He must know the facts because. Uh, uh, for many years, uh, he has to deal with the negotiation with China. Mm -hmm. So I, I really, uh, you know, uh, I'm uh, troubled to, to understand. Your reaction to that, uh, Stephen Mosier? Well, I don't see in, in six years of negotiations between Archbishop Chelly and, and uh, the Chinese government, I don't see that the Chinese government, that is to say the Chinese Communist Party, has made any concessions whatsoever. And even if they made concessions, privately, for example, or even in writing, they couldn't be trusted to keep them. Mm. What seems to be happening is we have now reached the stage in the negotiations where we're simply negotiating the surrender of the underground church, uh, the delivery of underground Catholics into the hands of the Patriotic Association, which is beholden to the Chinese Communist Party and answers to it. So uh, what, what, what sense is there in, in that? Uh, mm -hmm. I do have a, a, a thought other than naivete uh, that, about what's happening. I think that this may, be, this may be seen in the Vatican by some as a further step in the decentralization of power from the mm -hmm. Vatican to national churches. And, uh, you know, in, in, in actual fact, in some respects, we have a national church in Poland and Germany, which are at odds mm -hmm. over whether or not uh, people in irregular unions can receive communion. Uh, this may seem to be a further step in the same direction. It's not, of course. Mm -hmm. It would be the delivery of the Catholic Church in China and its believers and its, the clergy into the hands of the Chinese Communist Party, which clearly wants to eliminate it over time and does not wish mm -hmm. it well. Um, it, it, it's roughly like uh, a Roman emperor who is in the midst of persecuting uh, Catholics in Rome mm. being given control over the, the church in Rome. Why would you do this? I, I don't mm. understand it. Reggie Littlejohn, there was a comment from President Xi given recently to uh, party leaders, and he talked specifically about the need to stamp out religion, that, that it's, a, it's an obstacle to the power of the state. Give me a sense of how that plays out in the everyday lives of people, particularly those in the far-flung areas of China. Well, I, uh, there's a, a perfect example of that that came through in the Catholic News Agency that in November of last year, so just a couple months ago, uh, there was one province, J J Xinjiang province, where um, officials came into the homes of believers and removed Christian images and replaced them with images of President Xi. Mm. And the officials reported that 
uh, the Christian believers said that they had made a mistake in trusting in Jesus instead of trusting in the Communist Party. So that, to mm. me, shows something about what it's like in the lives of everyday believers. Oh, it's scary, frightening. Uh, Cardinal Zen uh, hand-delivered a letter from the underground bishop Shuang, to, uh, who's the bishop of the city of Chantal, and he delivered that letter to the pope himself when news of this deal with Beijing began to broke. Zen then went public with his displeasure over the potential deal, and the Vatican responded in a rather strongly written statement. We'll put it up on the screen for you. The pope is in constant contact with his collaborators, in particular in the Secretariat of State, on Chinese issues, and is informed by them faithfully and in detail on the situation of the Catholic Church in China and on the steps in the dialogue in progress between the Holy See and the People's Republic of China, which he follows with special attention. It is therefore surprising and regrettable that the contrary is affirmed by people in the church, thus fostering confusion and controversy. And that was from the Holy See Press Officer Director, Greg Burke. Uh, your reaction to that statement, Stephen Mosier, what's going on here? Well, I think many of us had hoped that the, the, the Vatican diplomat in charge of negotiations with China had simply overstepped his bounds, was over eager to get an agreement, any agreement, uh, to declare a successful end to the negotiations, and that perhaps Pope Francis wasn't fully informed as to what was going on. I think that's what drove Cardinal Zen, who's 86 years old, mm -hmm. to get on an airplane, fly halfway around the world to Rome, and wait two days for an audience with Holy Father to say, this is what's really happening in China, Holy Father. Uh, you know, can you, can you intervene? And according to Cardinal Zen, whom I believe is a, a wonderful prelate, a truthful man whom I've known for many years, um, the Pope said, we don't want another Cardinal Menzenti. And my heart breaks right. for poor the Bishop Peter Zhuang of Shanto in Guangdong province, who for decades has suffered imprisonment, sometimes torture, mm -hmm. being put in and out of jail time and time again, to be told that he has to step down, not just to be told that he has to step down, but he has to hand over his sea of faithful Catholics in the underground church to a bishop who was not only illegitimately ordained, but, but, but who was actually excommunicated from the church back in 2011. Mm. Apparently he burst into tears yeah, and, and is resolved to continue to carry his cross. It, it's, it's, it's so sad, and I'm sure that millions of Catholics in the underground church in, in China mm. feel, feel the same way. Um, abandoned mm -hmm. by their shepherd. I asked Cardinal Zen what he thought about the reassignment of Archbishop Savio Han. Now, Archbishop Han was the only Chinese member of the Curia, instrumental in translating Chinese texts and in that dialogue between the Vatican and the Chinese government. This was Zen's response. Watch. My impression is that uh, he has been on, uh, already a long time uh, put aside. Mm -hmm. huh? Uh, because uh, 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 Archbishop Savia and myself, uh, we are uh, uh, considered as, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> troublemakers because uh, mm -hmm. uh, we seem to be against the dialogue. We seem to, we are not against the dialogue. We are against a, a false optimism. Eh? Mm -hmm. And they want to go on on that way. Your thoughts, Reggie, on dealing with the Chinese government. And it seems to me in all my interviews with Cardinal Zen, he's been very wary, not of a conversation and a dialogue, but in who the dialogue partner is and whether you can trust them. I do not see any reason to trust the Chinese Communist Party in any way. They are officially atheistic. That is, their, that is their doctrine, and that's what they want to promote. Now, people have to understand there's the underground church and the official church. Right. The official church has to enforce the, uh, the laws of the land. One of the laws of the land has to do with forced abortion under the one-child policy or the two-child policy. Wow. This, this is directly in opposition to Catholic doctrine. Mm. And so, you know... Why, why should we trust a government that, that is forcibly aborting women to be the head of the Catholic Church? Yeah, it's scary. It, it's, it's really scary. In September, the Chinese government came out with new regulations, and these regulations are now in practice. They're in force, and I'm going to put these up for you. Here are the regulations. They took, they took effect 
February 1st. The five transformations, they call them, of the Catholic Patriotic Association include localizing religion, standardizing management, so that's control over the appointment of bishops, indigenize theology, contextualizing the doctrine, and show financial transparency and adapt Christian teachings as to mold them into institutions that reflect the objectives of the Communist Party. Uh, Stephen Mosier, your reaction to the implementation of these uh, goals now? Well, basically, the Chinese Communist Party has said that they are going to create a national church severed uh, officially from the Vatican. They're going to appoint their own bishops. They're mm. going to have their own liturgy. They're going to probably revise scripture. Uh, all of these things are intended to assert control over an organization that ultimately, of course, they want to eliminate from existence but, altogether. But, Stephen, let me stop they you for a second. They also have a new rule why, that, that why children would the 16 Vatican, and under. Why would the Vatican give legitimacy to this, though? That seems to be what's happening. It is, it, is, it is puzzling, bewildering, and disheartening to me that, that this should happen because there are, are, as we know, dozens of underground bishops faithful to the Vatican, faithful to the Holy Father, millions of underground Catholics faithful to mm. the Vatican, faithful to the Holy Father, who will feel like they have been abandoned by this. This will not expand the reach of the church in China. This will not give it some sort of official imprimatur that will enable it to go out and, and, and make new disciples. This will cause the church in China to contract uh, to people, to, for people to leave the church. And of course, everybody who's forced from the underground church into the official church, we have to understand, will be brought under surveillance. There are video cameras in all the churches in China. There are mm -hmm. undercover agents at every official mass taking names, noting who comes and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. And and children, uh, uh, families have been told not to bring their children to mass because the Chinese Communist Party is still determined to prevent the faith from being passed on to the next generation. It's obvious to everybody what their ultimate goal is. Mm -hmm. Why should the Catholic Church participate mm -hmm. in its own dissolution and destruction? So, Reggie, your thoughts on what should the church's position then be? The church has been in a hard spot for a long time. John Paul II wrestled with this. Benedict, I remember, wrote that letter to Chinese Catholics. But they really are caught. There's very little they can do given this situation. Well, that's right, because I, I think that they want to embrace, they want to help yeah. the Catholics in China. But how do you do that under a totalitarian regime that that's is right. doing everything it can to strangle Catholicism in China? Yeah. And I can't chart a path through this incredible minefield. But what I will say is this, which is my strong conviction mm -hmm. that no matter what the Chinese Communist Party does, it cannot stamp out the Holy Spirit. It cannot stamp out the power of the body and blood of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And as long as that exists in China and as long as there are faithful Catholics that are willing to shed their blood, even over this, even under these circumstances, mm -hmm. there will be a remnant there and that, that, the, that Jesus Christ promised that his church would remain and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Yeah. No, persecution ends up being the blossoming of the church no matter where it happens. But the, the problem is when you take an official, in Cardinal Zen's term, a fake structure and you imbue it with officialdom, not only from the government sense, but with the Vatican's blessing, that has the potential to confuse people. Now, I've been told for years, and Stephen Mosier, you can comment on this, that even those in the underground church and even those in the official church, they actually, there are a lot more believers and adherents to Rome than, might, than, than appearances might suggest. Your thoughts on that? Might the Vatican and might Pope Francis see something here that we're missing, that there is a remnant in that official organization that he wants to co-opt? Well, there, there certainly is a, a remnant and, uh, in the official organization. Uh, there are... Um, good priests everywhere. There are faithful laity everywhere who have never really abandoned uh, the one true faith and, and who are simply paying lip service to the, to the Chinese Communist Party demands that you put the party first and, and your faith second. Uh, and, 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 and I cannot 
criticize someone for doing that. I've only been arrested and put in jail in China for about three days. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the people who joined the Patriotic Church did so after 20 years of torture and imprisonment. Wow. I cannot say how much torture and imprisonment one should have to endure before making this kind of concession, making a mental reservation perhaps, and then saying, mm -hmm. all right, I'm, I'm going to uh, join the Patriotic Church, but everyone I know, all of my fellow priests, uh, the members of the laity will know that I am truly loyal to the Vatican. That's an individual decision that, that people mm -hmm. have to come to on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but for the millions of, of people in the underground church, uh, those are the people that my heart goes out to. Those are the people that mm -hmm. in, in years past we've helped build churches for, uh, we've helped mm -hmm. smuggle Bibles to, we've helped Cardinal Zinn, my old friend who now deceased of course, the Cardinal Archbishop of Manila, Mm -hmm. ran, and, and the, car, the archdiocese still runs, a seminary for Catholic priests, young men who've been able to leave China and right. come and study the Catholic faith, the true faith in Manila, and then go back into the underground church. Uh, Cardinal Pell, who's now unfortunately down in Australia, has made many trips to China mm -hmm. to support and give succor to the, the underground church. Cardinal Zen himself, of course, is the most famous example of this. Right. These are people who really know what's happening on the ground in China, and their, mm -hmm. their advice should be listened to. Mm. Reggie Littlejohn, I'm going to give you the final word. Your reaction to all of this, and what should we be doing for these people in the underground church who, again, they're caught between death in some cases and their faith. That's an awful position for anybody to be in. Well, you know, I, one of the accounts that I read that was very sad was, was of a priest whose bishop was one of the bishops was, was removed, mm. and he said, I don't know what to do. I'm, I'm basically, mm. I'm heartbroken. Uh, we can't go against the Vatican, but I'm thinking of surrendering my, my priesthood, my orders. Oof. And, yeah. you know, People in the West, we can pray, we can have masses said, uh, we can spread the word, and um, we can go to adoration, bring this before mm -hmm. our, our Lord, because as I said, I, I really think that the power of God, the power of Jesus Christ cannot be trampled, it cannot be strangled even by a, a force as powerful as the Chinese Communist Party. Mm -hmm. Reggie Littlejohn, thank you for your insight. Stephen Mosier, as always, author of the book, uh, Bully of Asia. Thank you for being here as well. And we should just remind you, we didn't mention this in the course of our conversation, but uh, Beijing appointed seven bishops that the Vatican approved. But there are between 30 and 40 underground bishops in China that are really running for their lives. They confect the sacraments at the peril of their own lives. So they should be remembered, they should be held up, and they should be defended. In a moment, I'm going to talk to the stars and the subjects of Clint Eastwood's new movie, 1517 to Paris. But first, some more Hollywood news. There is early hype emerging once again for the sequel of Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ. Actor Jim Caviezel, in an interview with USA Today, suggested that The Resurrection will be the biggest film of all time. The Hollywood Reporter is claiming that Caviezel is in talks to reprise his role as Jesus. Caviezel was tight-lipped about the movie, but he told USA Today, there are things that I cannot say that will shock the audience, but I'll tell you this much, the film Gibson is going to do is going to be the biggest film in history. It's that good, end quote. About a year ago, Mel Gibson told me in an exclusive interview that the Passion sequel would be anything but predictable. It's a, it's a big, it's a vast theological experience. And I think mm. you need to delve into what that means in, in a way that you take that as the centerpiece and you juxtapose it against many things that go on around it ah. and, and in other realms. Mm. So that you, you have to under, it, it gets pretty wild. It's like an acid trip, but I think. Uh, With the saints, it's okay. Yeah, right. It's okay. okay. You have a spirit guide to take uh, you through that's it. That's right. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's right. The release of The Resurrection is not expected for at least another year or two. Now, speaking of movies, Clint Eastwood's new film, The 1517 to Paris, opens nationwide next week. It tells the remarkable story of three Americans traveling together in Europe in 2015 who thwart a terrorist attack on a passenger train. The film is even more remarkable for featuring 
the story's real-life heroes, all non-actors, starring as themselves. I sat down with them recently, Anthony Sadler, Spencer Stone, and Alec Scarlatos, right here in our D.C. studio. Watch. Spencer, I want to start with you. Give me a sense of this dynamic. You all have known each other since middle school. Yeah, I mean, uh, me and Alex's moms are still neighbors to this day, uh, and collectively, yeah, since middle school, so about 12 or 13 years old. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we're just all kind of like three unique individuals that happen to become, you know, good friends. And uh, we've even, we're t we have the type of friendship basically that, you know, we can go a year without talking to each other, and there's no questioning if we're friends or not. You know, mm -hmm. we just pick up right where we left off. And, and Anthony, this was just, this is a trip, a group trip. You all are touring Europe. It was kind of a reunion of some sorts, like um, 20-something backpacking trip. Yeah. Alec was coming off deployment. Spencer was mm -hmm. stationed in Portugal. I was on summer going to my senior year of college. So it seemed like the perfect time to get back together. Mm. Well, it was, but it was. unexpected things happened. Alec, you, are, you all are sleeping on the train. You're between Amsterdam and Paris, and you hear this commotion. Well, I was actually the only one awake. They were asleep, and I was just, you know, texting some friends back home, and... I heard a gunshot and breaking glass, and I kind of put my head up, like, wondering what was that. And then a train employee comes running away from the noise at a full sprint. That wakes them up, and we all kind of pretty much at the same time look back to see what he's running from mm. and see a shirtless man with an AK. And that was pretty self-explanatory. And then on. what happened? You, what was the conversation like? Well, there wasn't really any conversation. I mean, we all yeah. turned around in our seats and got a, kind of got in, like, the ready position a little bit. But mm. then I saw... Uh, that he had either jammed the gun or something happened. He just hadn't started shooting yet, so I figured, you know, this is a window of opportunity. We got to do something. And then Alex said, "Go!" And right when he said, "Go," I took off. What? I mean, was it instinctive? Why did you take off? To, I mean, the guy's got an AK. I mean, he can, he I mean, can cut really, right through just, you. It just came down to pure survival. We didn't want to die, and there wasn't a whole lot of options. We were going 200 miles an hour on the train in the middle of the countryside. This guy's got an automatic weapon. 300 rounds of ammunition, what are you going to do? You know, you're either going to sit there and die or you're going to get up and do something. And nobody else was moving. Everyone was pretty paralyzed, understandably. Yeah, and, and you're, you jump in right after Alec. I mean, the three of you move yeah. down the aisle together. Yeah. They're military trained. You're not. Right. Any hesitation? Any worry? Yeah, I was worry initially at first because um, your eyes see the gunman, but your brain's telling you no way this is happening. And then within seconds, Spencer's up tackling him, and I'm kind of, the kind of process through my head, like, what's he doing? And then he tackles him, and then all my thought process shut down. It was like, now at this point, I just got to go help my friend. So it became a, mm. once Spencer tackled him, Alec went, then it was like, we're all in at this point. Mm. And, and, I mean, do you think there was any divine intervention here in that this guy, he's got this weapon, he tries to shoot you with it, right? Or you yeah. try to shoot him, it's jammed. Uh, yeah, well, Alec tried to shoot him with his handgun, but there was no ammunition in it. But, I mean, if you take up, and that's the great thing about the movie, yeah. is that people think we just went down there and beat this guy up, and that was that. Right. There were so many things that went our way and in our favor, and we all believed that was orchestrated by God. And we believed that God put us in that position, you know, and kind of led us throughout our whole entire lives up until that point. We all kind of feel like that was our mission in life to, to, mm -hmm. to a certain extent. Uh, and the odds of the everything odds, happening yeah. are just too astronomical to be up to chance. I mean, yeah. like he said, the two different guns not going off, us being in that time and place, right. and just everything that went our way, if one thing went the other way, we'd probably end up dead. Yeah, and, and this terrorist, he had, I mean, he had a box cutter. He cut you bad. Yeah, he cut, he cut your, your finger. I mean, he almost cut your finger off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and he's slashing the whole time, right, at both of you. Yeah, well, uh, you know, he's trying to slip my throat, basically. Uh, but luckily, I had my chin kind of tucked, his into, tucked into his back. And that's another fact right there. Okay, yeah, he cut my thumb. But what are the chances that we stop at a train station uh, where the police came on board and only mm -hmm. 45 minutes away, uh, one of the best hand surgeons in France <laughs> is there waiting to do my surgery? So that was just mm -hmm. another thing, I believe, just like... God fully took care of us that day. Yeah. It was just pretty crazy. Like each moment, like he goes from AK, then he drops that, then a pistol comes out, right. and then a box cutter comes out, and we're just like, where is this guy getting all this stuff from? Mm -hmm. So like, as we're all scrambling around him and these weapons are coming out, it's like a flurry of just different things. There were two other people that tried to, to tackle this guy or at least block him. They were not terribly successful, but they did. Be was that before you all 
that was before that uh, we were even aware of anything going on. Mm -hmm. uh, the names were Damien and Mark McGallion, right. and Mark McGallion actually plays himself in the movie as well. Oh, he does along his with his wow. wife. Yeah, and honestly, without them having that initial confrontation with the terrorist and doing what they did, and pre Mark pretty much taking the bullet for us, we would have never been in the position to do anything. Did Mark was Mark the person shot in the neck, and yes. you you really saved his life? Yeah. Tell people what happened there. I mean, you're uh, trained as a medic, too. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was a medic in the Air Force, so that came in handy. And, uh, I mean, I, we just got done kind of choking the terrorist out. He's unconscious at this point. And, uh, and then Anthony and Alec call it, hey, this guy's been hit because he had been crawled in between these seats. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first thing I see looking over the seat is him collapsing into the aisle, spewing blood out of his neck. Uh. And, I mean, I just knew, you know, just I had to go over there and help him do something. I had the training. And so threw him down, make sure, hey, make sure this guy doesn't wake up. I crawled over to Mark, took my shirt off. I was going to use that as a bandage to hold pressure with. Didn't work. And then, uh, well, I just, you know, immediately looked at his, his wound, and it was, there was pressure behind it, so I knew mm. it was his artery. Mm. And uh, so I just threw the shirt down, stuck my hand into his neck, found the artery, climped it off. So. Wow, unbelievable. Tell me about this movie now. I mean, you wrote a book. Now we've got the movie. Um, was there any hesitation playing yourselves, Absolutely. Alec? I mean, I you'd mean, never, I assume you've, you hadn't acted before. Correct, we had no acting experience. But when Clint asked us to play ourselves, I mean, we at first were like, of course, we'd love the opportunity. Sounds like a lot of fun. And the second he left the room, it was kind of like, what are we getting ourselves into? Do we actually want to do it? Do you, I mean, because again, we're not actors. It was a huge risk on his part, and it was a risk on our part, too, because we didn't know if we were going to be able to pull it off or not. Right. Yeah. It being our story, too, we didn't want to risk the success of the film, basically, by going into it and botching the acting job. But mm. his confidence in us gave us the confidence to do it. And in hindsight, we actually are appreciative of it. Well, I want, I want to play a little clip. This is uh, Clint Eastwood talking about uh, casting these guys in their own story. Watch this. I looked at a lot of actors, good actors too, but I kept looking at the guys and I kept looking at their faces. And finally one day I just said, do you guys think you could play yourself? And the more they thought about it, the more they got with it. And it turned out that they had a lot of natural gift. Yeah, that's about what it's well, yeah. Natural <laughs> gift, dang. guys. Hey, that's what we're so, saying. So well, it had to be though. It's one thing to say, okay, I'm gonna play myself. When you get in front of a camera and you've got all these lights and you've got 50 people looking at you, it does change the dynamic. I mean, Absolutely. And, and yeah. particularly if you're not trained to deal with all that incoming. How did you deal with it? And was it difficult reliving what arguably is the most traumatic moment of your life? Uh, you know, it, it was pretty nerve wracking for all of us going into our first scenes, for sure. I mean, just because having all those people in the room and you're supposed to be portraying yourself and picking and choosing what you want to share with the world, mm -hmm. but also trying to you know stay true to who you are. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think after we got a few scenes in, under our belt, we kind of fell into it a little bit. Clint Eastwood makes the environment so relaxed and he's so mm -hmm. you know cool with you and kind of on your level uh, that it just kind of made it easy. But honestly, and then reliving the train. Uh, it wasn't that hard because we don't. We kind of look at all, all of this as a as a positive experience mm. for us. And yeah, Anthony, what did you? What was the first scene shot? What did, what, what are those? Um, for me, it was um, a scene where me and Spencer are just um, in the living room watching a football game, and he's overweight and complaining about like ba basically, overweight and complaining. Basically, oh basically, boy, he's what an opening! Uh, Jenny, <laughs> Jenny Craig spokesman. Yeah. Right, right. So he's just we're just sitting down watching a football game and he's talking about joining the Air Force. And it couldn't have been a better scene for me to come into because just like me and him, and I was nervous because you know on set Clint Eastwood, but it was just really chill. We were just me and him in the living room, and so that was kind of the mantra for the whole shoot. It was just like do what you do, and Clint was like I'll do the rest. Wow. I'm sure there was. It must have been wonderful being called to the set. Overweight guy, go to the yeah. set. We need you here. Get out of here. It's awful. Overweight. Yeah. The guy. Hey, no, he's good. Yeah, no, that's what I think. When he I was wearing a fat suit at the time that uh, Leonardo DiCaprio just wore, so I was wearing greatness. Was, oh, okay. You know. well, Leonardo. <laughs> Leonardo didn't need that fat suit. But well, that's another story. Alec. Yeah. When you, what did what did, did Clint Eastwood say anything to you or? approach this in any way that put you at ease or that brought the best performance out of you? Oh, absolutely. Um, first of all, he was just so relaxed and so down to earth with, mm -hmm. with us. It was just, it was very easy to treat him not as an equal, but definitely 
we weren't afraid of him mm -hmm. either. It, you it, trusted him. Yeah, we trusted him, and it was very easy to talk to him about what we were worried about and things like that, about the accuracy of the film, and he took care of it. And the other thing was the accuracy of everything. Yeah. Uh, we, I mean, we filmed in the same location, we were wearing the same clothes, had a lot of the same people, like even down to the, the cross that I was wearing, they matched it almost identically, every little detail. And that made it really easy to get back in basically the same mindset that we were the day everything happened, and it was just like we were reliving it twice. This sense of faith, and it's not a preachy movie, but that sense of faith that somehow a divine hand is guiding you, that is present here in the film. Oh, very How important. How important was that to you? Well, I mean, very important because, again, looking back, um, not even realizing it at the time, of course, but looking back, hindsight's always twenty twenty. but you can see in the movie all these things that even like failures with Spencer joining the Air Force and mm -hmm. the, everything we did as far as like the jobs that we did, the things that we learned all came into play on the train that day. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't, I mean, we couldn't have really planned it better, but our lives leading up to that point were just basically preparing us for that moment. And that really comes mm -hmm. across in the film. How about you, Anthony? That, that, um, that, de that sense of detail, it seems to me Clint Eastwood had an eye for that faith dimension. He he wanted that. Yeah. He wanted most, the light shown on a little bit. Most definitely, because he he met with us a few times before casting us, mm -hmm. so he knew the people we were. He knew the dynamic of who we are and why we did what we did. Mm -hmm. So um, from the get go, he wanted it to be accurate. He didn't want to Hollywood it up or movie it up. So he wanted to tell our story, and he knew that that was a part of our story. And he knew that had to do a lot. Faith is what had to do a lot with why we got up that day. So he wanted to make sure that was in the film for sure. Before I let you go, Spencer, what do you want people to take away from this film? Uh, well, I just want people to take away that, you know, we are three ordinary guys uh, that were just put into a situation, you know, that was a little extraordinary and uh, that not just us, but anyone's capable of doing something. You know, if they see something going wrong, mm. you have the choice and you have more than likely the skills, whether you know it or not, to do something. And uh, hopefully you can just inspire a uh, generation to... Uh, you know, step up and, and be less of a bystander. Did you all know of the guy in 9-11 that um, his name escapes me? I've interviewed his widow in the past who, when the plane was, you know, when he saw what was happening, he said, let's roll. Mm -hmm. Right. 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 Did, you, did you all have any awareness? Did you know of that story yeah. I've when seen you the were film. in the train? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh and, I, and I've seen that. Yeah. I watched the movie Everyone. shortly before shooting. I've seen it, but I watched it again because I was like, this is really similar to uh -huh. how you know, train down an aisle way, yep. and mm -hmm. it was powerful. To watch, wow. I've seen it years ago, but to watch it again, mm -hmm. it was powerful. So you knew that story before you got on right. the train? Yes, oh, correct. Oh, fascinating. Thank you all for being here. Thank you what for a film, what an experience, and thank you for daring to step out when others sat in their seat and were willing to take it and be victims. So, um, just didn't want to die. Bless you all. <laughs> well, want to die, well, you, and you're also going out of your way to save others, and, and look, you, you all may not have been here if things had turned a different way. So Absolutely. the fact that you're willing to do it is uh, a great testament to your character and who you are. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Thanks for you. having us. Thank you. Thank you. Look at the baby soda, Spencer. Alex, shut the heck up. <laughs> <laughs>